Risk high reward pitch, and the risk is as high as ever against this lineup. 56 degrees. It's a beautiful day at Como as we're off and running. First pitch strike called by Scott Clyde tonight. So point up higher and the crew chief for this crew. And after one pitch, I'm with a little defensive alignment change. We already see happening behind Lundstrom. Now, what is that? Do, do you think that was a mind game, or was that Missouri not being in the proper defensive alignment that, uh, from the very first pitch of the game? I, I, I would go with the latter of the two, as there's a nice breaky ball spun it for a strike to Colby Shelton to shortstop. Shelton, 13 home runs, 27 RBIs, the Alabama transfer. He has been incredible so far this year, and he's taken over in the leadoff spot since the LSU series. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect him to be button. And after he takes a strike, you expect the guy to, to pull the ball. Powerful lefty hitter. So just felt like maybe Trevor Austin was a little bit out of position there. Maybe running out of time with the pitch clock. Who knows? What two from the sophomore? That's a little chin music. Upstairs at 91. Does lead the team with nine hit by pitches this year. So yesterday they announced the Golden Spikes midseason watch list. Two guys in the top three in this Gators lineup were on it. As there's a tank at a high breaky ball. Count full. Shelton, the leadoff man, and then Caglione in the three spot. And, and they, you mentioned the top four guys in this order, all still with OPSs north of 1,000 and almost a full week into April. Something else to watch. Both of these starting pitchers struggle with the leadoff guys. Full count offering. Jammed him in the air, but that's going to find the seats on a play. Good pitch there, 3-2. Posing leadoff hitters at 375 against Logan Lunsford this year and 368 against uh, Brandon Neely, for that matter. Shelton's been on base in seven strength games. Another 3-2 coming. That strike three call. Frozen with the fastball at 92. It's a big pitch. Obviously, you want to avoid a leadoff walk in any circumstance because of how deadly they are, especially after getting well out ahead in the count. It's a good pitch. I, I thought initially maybe Shelton was just looking for something off speed, but that also is, is on the corner. You could see why he would think there's just not a lot he can do with that. So what's for Dowin? 30 innings on the year, has 24 strikeouts. The strikeout numbers have not been as grand as they were in his freshman campaign. Tommy Evans, the junior, this might be the hottest bat right now in this lineup, hitting 385 in SEC play, the highest average of any Gator. And swings over the top. This breaking ball is looking maybe as good as it's looked all season. Yeah, I think what has to excite you the most as a Missouri fan right now is the way Lunsford is coming out and attacking and also mixing his pitches right away. Not wasting any time. Another 0-2 on its way. Did he go? He did not on the appeal. That's the first base up by Eric Goshia. The Missouri dugout was shocked, for but I, I, I didn't see that. I don't know about you, Max. I didn't see that as a swing in real time. I didn't think so either, but look, look close enough at least for the appeal. It was a good 0-2. Goes back that way, back to back case. Well, you mentioned to Max that, that Logan Lunsford's strikeout numbers are not this year where they were last year. Not to say they've been poor, but they certainly haven't been anything exceptional. You wouldn't know it from uh, these first couple of at bats, and he's done it in very different ways. The fastball in the corner against Shelton, this time getting Evans to chase. Here is Jack Caglione, and there's a vicious hack from the floor to first baseman. And the walk off, two run home run to win the series on Sunday versus Mississippi State. Hit the 491 foot home run back on Tuesday. And he's down in the count here, 0 2. The boys timed up both these first two pitches pretty well. Homeward in back-to-back -back games in seven of his last nine games. Lutzford 0-2. Trying to strike out the side in order. Trying to set the tone here as you can in the first inning on a Friday night at home. Important for Mizzou to try to build confidence any way they can get it. Lutzford with a deep breath. Here he comes. And foul back to the screen. You know, obviously, confidence is going to be an issue for any team that comes in with the the one and eight SEC record that Missouri has, but on top of that, they have just one win in their last 21 games against Florida. Got out in front, but poked that one well. Yeah, this matchup has been utterly dominated since 2016 by the Gators. 21 games, they have won 20 of them. Is he trying to change course here? It coma one two coming. 
And that's hammered deep out towards center field. Pier is back, and he'll have room for it. Wind is blowing it from right to keeps that one in the yard. Three up, three down for the sophomore. Demise, a couple of walks, a couple of hit bats with as well as Jared Curtis takes up high. This is really another guy that Mizzou is happy to see. Technically back and healthy because he was pulled in the ninth inning on Wednesday. Came up a little gimpy after sprinting down to first base. A guy who needs that speed. This is one he is known for. And he's been swinging it as well as he has in his time at Mizzou over the last couple of weeks. Four hits, four runs, two stolen bases in the two midweek games. And he sends a charge out to right field. Evans angling towards the corner, not going to get there. Curtis on his horse around second. He's sprinting for third and in there easily. Lead off triple. Max, we talked about it in the top of the first inning. The work that Lunsford did to set the tone in a matchup that has not been kind to Missouri, an SEC season that has not been kind to Missouri. Well, Jared Curtis got that memo as well. He just kind of gets extended, sends this one out to right field. There isn't a lot of wind, especially by Taylor Stadium standards, but he had a lot of slice on the ball, and it, it just took it away into the corner, and, and that's an easy triple for Curtis. In the end, if he had gone in standing up and taken a turn, he might have had a chance to get to the plate on a relay that got away from Florida. Jackson Beeman takes a strike, and I think any questions about the hamstring for Jared Curtis immediately laid to rest here because he, he was moving as good as ever. Yeah, although I think Jared Curtis could have had a triple on about 80% jog there. Oh, one coming. Oh, and outside. Jackson Beeman, another guy who missed the last game on Wednesday due to some soreness. But one of the best bats in this lineup when it comes to producing exit velos. Hitting 302, five home runs so far. Comes that far. Leads the team and walks to patient hitter. He's got 15 walks. Best OPS on the team at 1,088. Just a little bit out ahead of Jackson Lovich, who's in the hole right now. Neely working from the first base side of the slab. His one, two. Just outside. He's got that nasty slider. It's got tight movement. It's got high velo to it. It's upwards of high 80s. It's touched 90, hit 90 last week with the slider against Mississippi State. Guy who's got starter stuff, but was coming out of the bullpen because, I mean, the attitude. He's got the mindset of a guy who's getting the final three outs of the game. He even grounds it right underneath the glove of Neely. And the only play for Curlin's at first. And Mizzou is on the board here in the first inning. Leadoff triple makes it uh, almost difficult not to score. But you still got to put the ball in play against a guy who we know has strikeout stuff that can go up against anybody and if he'd been able to get down in just a split second sooner and get his glove on that it would have uh, maybe put Curtis in a tough spot but uh, in in the end Beeman uh, does his job good situational hitting 17th RBI on the season for the fourth year sophomore sophomore excuse me from Lincoln Missouri and Jackson Beeman and now it's Trevor Austin who kind of got off the schneid on Tuesday and Wednesday but you know a lot of the conversation with Carrick Jackson about how well this team played in the midweek. There's a check swing foul ball. He put up 25 runs in two days. But it was against UT Martin, midweek, two-game series. How can that translate over to an SEC weekend? Because it hasn't so far this year. Yeah, I don't think it does, to be frank with you, Mac. I mean, I, I just, it's two totally different things. You know, UT Martin doesn't have a Brandon Neely. They don't have a Jack Caglion. They just don't. Uh, so, to me, it you still got to try to take care of your business and whatever confidence maybe you can get out of that, but it's not the same thing. Makes a slider outside. Trevor Austin, a guy who's been there, done that for this program for a long time. Today, his 148th appearance, 134th start. He's had back-to-back -back games where he's scored three times. He's been getting on base at will. That's a good swing on one here. It bloops it out to shallow right field, down for the second base hit of the inning. That's really unlucky for Neely. I think uh, Curtis didn't get a ton behind his fly ball to down the right field line, but he got enough that Neely can't really have any complaints. This is just good placement. I, I don't think Trevor Austin gets a whole lot on this ball. And in fact, if he had gotten a little bit more, it probably would have been a simple play for Evans in right field, who feels like he just has been in the wrong spot for both of those. But Missouri will take it any way they can get it uh, with the way they have struggled immensely to put runs on the board in SEC play. So Austin aboard now for Jackson Lovich, who makes his return. He's missed every game since game three of the Kentucky series. So last played a few weekends ago on a Saturday, game two of that tight series. I mean, Mizzou was very competitive against Kentucky. 
They dropped two of the three, but a play or two away from taking that series. And then they were really competitive last weekend against Vanderbilt, like you said, in the open. I mean, you allow 10 runs, three, three, and four. And those are the run tally totals from each game from the Commodores, top 10 team in the country, and you come away with no wins. So there's a mighty hack from Lovich. Tall, lanky guy who sometimes chases too high. Can't quite get to that pitch, youngster, but the offense scored two runs last weekend. Neely with the walk, pause, and the one-two. Yeah, that's already a, a big run for Missouri over, standing over at first. I mean, a big run that already scored, and then a big potential run standing at first in Trevor Austin. The Tigers have only scored even two runs or more in three out of their nine SEC games so far. And now he's worked it full. And, well, Mizzou's offense is last in the SEC at average at 248. They're last at slugging at LBP, two. They do have 41 stolen bases. That's fourth in the conference, and got a lot of guys who will are not shy about trying to swipe 90 feet. See, maybe Trevor Austin is in motion here with the full count offering, and I think Florida and, and Neely thinking the same thing. This is the third time, actually, in 10 SEC games they've scored in the first inning, which is more than you would expect for how few runs they've scored in general prior to we're both in that Kentucky series. And that's ball four. Mizzou last in the SEC and walks. That's their 128th of the season, but, well, we didn't really have to see Jackson Lovich swing it with that tape around his thumb to get on base, and this is an early trip out to the mound now. Mizzou on the board and threatening for a crooked number. This is something they really have not done so far to this point in SEC play, and that's put up a big one. Yeah, I mean, Kevin O'Sullivan with a pitch count really blossomed over 80, and he almost just hit Caden Peer, yanked a fastball inside at 94. So he was a starter two years ago as a freshman with a 3.76 ERA. Caden Peer, meanwhile, is a freshman and just had his first collegiate home run back on Wednesday. You mentioned the pitch count. You know, to me, that's a big part of this, too. Obviously, the most important thing is keeping Mizzou from putting a crooked number on the board. But you also need Neely more so than most pitchers to, to keep his pitch count under control early in the game. If you're going to get anything resembling length out of him on a Friday night, and obviously you go in expecting you're going to have to use your bullpen a little bit more than you typically would on a Friday night if you were throwing a, a more prototypical starter. But as you mentioned, this isn't a guy who's likely to throw 110 pitches in this game. So every pitch is even more valuable for him. Pierre lays off the high fastball and works the count back even to it too. Neely's pitched at Taylor Stadium before as a starter back in 2022, started a game here. Went four and two-thirds innings, allowed four runs on seven hits, took the loss that day against the Tigers. 2-2, two -two, cut on and miss. That's a big strikeout for out number two. He gets his first K of the night. That is a big one, especially because, you know, ball four obviously would have loaded up the bases. Right in under the hands. Maybe it is ball four, but that's a, never a pitch that, that's going to be taken by fear it's a strike almost the whole way in and then gets under his hands you can see he's almost got his the knob of his bat on his Tigers uh, script on his chest as he's trying to swing JD Hernandez now the junior from Trenton New Jersey transferred over from Seton Hall hitting 284 this year hit 360 though in the month of March might be the hottest bat on this team right now he just got a fastball through down the middle, dumped it foul. That's going to be the best pitch for him probably to hit this A-B, and now he's down 0-2. You mentioned Brandon Neely taking that loss. That would be the only loss a Florida pitcher yep. has taken in the last 21 games between these two teams. Yeah, so maybe a little chip on his shoulder. And he dominated Mizzou with two outings last year in Gainesville. Two on, two away. One run in the 0-2. Sailed that one high. Tanner Garrison's done a great job taking over as the everyday catcher for this team behind the home plate. Especially defensively. And the, the bat, he's coming off a good series. We'll see him coming up to bat soon. And over last weekend, Homer had a nice one versus Mississippi State. And a check swing foul ball. Neely last year had two saves on back-to-back -back days against Mizzou. Were two innings plus on back-to-back -back days. Four and a third total. One hit, one walk, no runs, six Ks. And I don't want to belabor the point, but it is, I think, hard to overstate how different it is physically and mentally to do that versus to start on a Friday night.
Another one, two. And breaking ball outside. Hernandez was 0 for 5 on Tuesday, and then had the day off back on Wednesday against UT Martin. And the best hitter in SEC play average wise for this Tigers team at just 250. Champ shot into the crowd. 30 pitches already, though, in the first inning. And it was Kane Fisher who was the Friday night starter. He kind of was utilized more as a piggybacker for Brandon Neely last Friday at home. Lefty who came in in the middle of an inning, pitched very strongly. But Fridays have been tough for a staff for this Florida team. That's in the dirt, and now everybody's going to be in motion on the next pitch home. I mean, Jack Hagley owns the Sunday guy, and he's been far and away the best starter. What a good swing on it. Boy, how often do you see Hernandez just turn to the dugout and said, I'm right on this. That was a look of confidence on a 3-2. Yeah, I don't know if I would do that. Yeah, maybe a little bit too much. Too early. It's the first inning. I mean, it's a long weekend here for a team that's 1-8 in SEC play, nevertheless. Got to have confidence, though. If you're not confident in yourself, who else is going to be? Two on, two away. There go the runners for the 3-2. And Hernandez takes outside. Fist pump, base is loaded. And up steps Matt Garcia. Mizzou knocking at the door of a crooked number in the first inning of this series. It's been a triple, a ground ball out that scored a run, then a single, a walk, and another walk. And now, I mean, we're talking, this is going to be pitch 34 and batter 7. Not the start you draw up for Brandon Neely, who last week made his first start since June 6th of 2022. First pitch swing in, Garcia dumps it foul. Boy, Tanner Garrison never saw that. It wasn't near him. It was not a play down the left side. But this is also a time of day, Nate, where the shadows play a factor because it's just about halfway almost between the mound and home plate. Oh, and two. Garcia thought that one was up. And Kirk Jackson's out of the Missouri dugout. And I, I don't think he's arguing that pitch was high, though he might think so. I think he, he's saying that Neely might have gotten away with slightly quick pitching Garcia in that instance because Garcia's kind of looking down. Now it's on him a little bit because he's getting into the box here, and he's still looking down. Huge spot for Matt Garcia and Mizzou. Up a run, but the base is loaded. The 0-2 from Neely. Chopped on the ground towards Curlin. Underhand flip, and Florida gets out of the inning. They strand the bases loaded as Mizzou strikes first. The left fielder, versatile defender. He plays third as well, and he takes a strike. And Logan Lutzford is working very quickly, as he always does, especially when things are going his way. And he looks to be locked in in rhythm. Sheldon, that's what she has a little bit inside. Crowd wanted that fastball at 91. Left fielder from Lake City, Florida, hitting 295, eight home runs this year. 27 RBIs is one shy of his total a year ago. Leads a team of doubles, multi RBI games. He's really been a producer. Also, 20 walks leads the team. Second year at Florida after coming over. From the Juco level with Santa Fe, which is a school in Gainesville, just down the road. There's also a Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico, which just feels like it shouldn't be allowed. Can get a little confusing at times, I'm sure. 2-2 two -two for Lutzford. Rushed it back. I originally, when I saw that, I assumed it was in New Mexico until I looked it up and found out that it was in, in fact in Gainesville. When they had multiple, <laughs> it, that was starting to, starting to tip me off. Payoff pitch. He's got foul. Shellnut's got an LPS over 1,000. We talked about the first four guys in the lineup all do. He's the fourth. Had a funky game on Tuesday. No official plate appearances. Or at bats, excuse me. He walked and he was hit by a pitch three times against Florida a &M. Another 3-2 from Lunsford. Chopped right back at him. Speared it out of the air. Well done. And it's four up, four down. It's not just any four up, four down, Max. It's the four 1,000 boys up and the four 1,000 boys down. 
and uh, for, for Logan Lunsford, that has to feel like a dream start. He, he doesn't get into the best defensive position, right? It's become more popular for guys to sort of use their whole body, fall off the side of the mound a little bit. You can see there his right foot on the follow-through crosses over his left. It's not the most athletic position in the world, but he's still at least definitely seemed like it was still bothered. Yeah, it looked like the those, ring finger. On those practice tosses. 25 pitches, certainly something to keep in the back of your mind with Lunsford going forward. It's Cade Curlin now. And we'll see how that affects the young sophomore starter. A lot of talent from Tampa, Florida on this team. And I think that you can't have three guys out there. You can't have two on deck hitters. And that's the little break we're having right now. Just sent Luke Heyman back, or excuse me, Dale Thomas back into the dugout. To be fair to Thomas, there's a screen set up over there just to. Uh, He's the not the in the way. They're going to get hit. That does look inviting. It looks like a perfect warm up spot. And since the comeback here, it's three straight balls. Curlin hitting 299. He had one of the five home runs this team club back on Tuesday. It was two for four with three RBIs. And the huge walk-off single with the bases loaded at two outs a week ago. Today, last Friday at home versus Mississippi State. It's on an 0-2 pitch. And he's aboard here via the base on balls. That, uh, it feels like at least a yellow flag from Mizzou's standpoint, the way that uh, the ball was coming out of Lunsford's hand then in that plate appearance against Curland. There is uh, so there's some calisthenics going on in the Mizzou bullpen, but nothing, uh, no baseball activities, I wouldn't say, at this point. We'll keep an eye on it. Carter Roostown out there, who's been a weekend starter, and it's TBD right now for Sunday for Mizzou, and it's kind of a matter of how Lunsford does and how Pimentel does tomorrow to see if they can use Roostown in piggyback fashion to try to win one of these first two games. But Kerwell, that walk-off hit he had last Friday was incredible because, first of all, Florida, 6-3 in the SEC. They have trailed in all nine conference games and now make it 10. Still a heavy dose of balls from Westford since the hand got knocked a bit. But Kerwin went up there, got into the box too late, and it was an automatic strike to start the A.V. Tie game, ninth inning, two outs. Bases loaded. Next pitch was a strike, and he singled back up the middle. Who came in at the dish? Sophomore from Longwood, Florida. And he rifles one right to third. Leaping catch is made for Trevor Austin. Missouri perhaps had some bad luck on the comebacker that got a piece of Lunsford's pitching hand, but there's some good luck because that was the best contact Florida's had, maybe the best contact either team has had so far in this game. Trevor Austin going maybe not to the absolute highest he can, but somewhere close to it. So Luke Hamid retired, and that brings up the third baseman, Dale Thomas, trying to continue... This second inning for Florida against Logan Lunsford, guy who they beat in their home ballpark a year ago. Lunsford's second appearance against the Gators. He took the loss down in Gainesville last year in a game in which Brandon Neely actually did get the save on the other side. Dale Thomas, fifth year senior. It's his second year with the Gators after he came over from Coastal Carolina. We're up just a couple hours outside of Gainesville. And that's where the first time that J.D. Hernandez has been tested behind the dish after the test. But for Dale Thomas, his dream, lifelong dream at that, was always to come and play for UF on the diamond. He's made that a reality, and he's playing real well of late. Do you see what his long-term life goal is? Navy SEAL. And if he's already accomplished his first uh, lifelong dream, who's to say he couldn't go two for two? You wouldn't Absolutely. bet against him, would you? Sure, he's a tough kid. Gonna be tough to be at the hot corner. Gonna be tough to go be a Navy SEAL as well. 
I don't think you have to hold your breath that long to play the high corner. <laughs> no. The job description Just for the change split a little bit. second when it's lined at your way. It's like Trevor Austin. You know, Thomas made 14 starts last year, hit 250. This is his 171st game of his college career. Already graduated, graduated last year. It's a Florida team that we talked about how often Mizzou is trying to swipe bases. Florida's kind of the polar opposite when it comes to that. Just 16 stolen bases this year, second to last of the SEC. But runner goes on the pitch as that's hit out to right field, and Beeman makes the waist high catch to end the inning. What's first? The low major opponents are mixed in there. First pitch is belted deep out to left center field from Drew Colbertson, but it's right to Tyler Shelna. You know, wind's been blowing out here just about every game I've done here, so I'm getting a little too excited with the wind coming in a little bit. Where I'm going with that is if you pull up the SEC numbers, obviously Missouri is nowhere near a 760 OPS at six runs a game. To their credit, you know, I said during the first inning, you said, you know, part of it is about carrying over momentum from the UT Martin games in the midweek when they put up 25 runs across two games. And, and I said, you know, I don't think there is much of a way to do it because you're just dealing with a totally different caliber of pitcher and a totally different level of pressure. At the same time, in the first inning, those Missouri hitters looked more confident than they should be. So I guess they're at least bringing in a little bit of that mojo. And, and you know, as we said, if you have to be the first one to believe in yourself before anybody else will. Got 28 runs over the two games, four homers. Man at the plate at two of them. And now he's getting a chance on a weekend with a start. Brock Daniels in the night spot. First base, Vinny homered on Tuesday, homered again on Wednesday. Brock Daniels, I mean, check out. Five RBIs entering this week, then he had five on Tuesday, and then almost matched it, had four the next day. And Brock Daniels hits one out the other way. A lazy fly ball towards Sheldon again. And there's two down. Back to the top of the order, and this looks like it's going to be an easy three up, three down inning. That's what Brandon Neely needed. And we go to the bottom of the ninth in all three games versus Mississippi State and won that series. It is amazing, though, and it speaks to the quality of the opponents they've played and the quality of opponents they've beat, that they have 11 losses overall this year, which is tied for third most in the SEC, and they're ranked sixth in the country. You don't expect to see at this stage, at any stage of the season, the number six team in the country ranked at 17 and 11. And, and some of that is illustrated then by the gap in RPI that they're at number 21. But uh, nonetheless, it shows the respect that, that coaches and, and the D1 baseball folks have uh, for the caliber of, of schedule they've played. And, and certainly you can back it up with the talent level on this team that they might well be the number six team in the country. The caliber of the schedule and the opponents, I think, as well as just the program itself, right? Coming off a national runner-up finish, losing a game three at the College World Series down West U. This team was 54 at 17 a year ago. They were 20 and 10 in SEC play, SEC champs. 2-2, two -two, cut on and miss. Strikeout number three for Logan Lunsford. Garrison was way late on that fastball. Don't know if he was just looking for something off speed, but we talked about it. Sequencing is is one of the strengths for Lunsford, and. He really needed it in this game, and, and you know, why wouldn't the bench be feeling good? They, in every way, Missouri could have started well in this game. They have started well. And we'll see if they adjust second time through the order, because this is the ninth spot right now. Let's pull him back on the bunt attempt. Is Chamberlain Guy, the center fielder, who is really a late addition to this lineup after Michael Robertson was initially pegged in there until about 20 minutes before first pitch. Lutzford has not allowed a base hit so far. And that is since Skyward. Skyscraper out towards Jarrett Curtis, who's still in the shade. And there's two down. That's four straight retired. We go back to the top of the order now. But going back to the Garrison strikeout, I mean, Nate, you look at the scouting report. When is Lutzifer at his best? It's when he's getting chases at that high fastball. That's a pitch you just got to lay off of. And I, I feel he's made them respect, at least the first time through the order, all three of, of his pitches in fastball, curveball, changeup. And when you do that, that fastball plays faster, especially when it has the carry it does up in the zone. Now, 
Colby Shelton's up now at the top of the Florida order. The downside of sequencing, as we've talked about it, mixing pitches as much as Lunsford has so far, is that a lot of these nine Gators already saw everything he's going to throw at him. He doesn't have a lot new in his bag for the second or maybe a third trip to the lineup, but that's a really good changeup right there. And this is what they did after there was a first strike on Colby Shelton the first time, and that is send Trevor Austin from third over to shallow right center, you could say, basically, as that's turned on and belted out to right field, beaming over to it, and makes the grab just in front of the wall. To LSU. LSU had really been slumping and jumped out to a 9 0 lead last night for his Vandy and almost let that thing slip away. Well, Arkansas was trailing early last night. Hagan Smith was mowing him down again, but how much can you say about a guy when he doesn't have the normal control? He entered last night with 10 walks on the season, had four, but well over 100 pitches and still just able to get the win. This one's been going by quickly because Logan Lutzford has really found it from the onset, and Brandon Neely's hoping that that second inning is indicative of what is to come here in the third and into the fourth as well. And it's not going to give you too much length. The pitch count's already at 46. He's been a reliever all year until last Friday. That's strike three call. Good start. That's five in a row sat down by Brandon Neely. Tell you what, we talked about some of the mental differences between closing and starting. One of the things that I've always thought just flies under the radar we take for granted about starters is how quickly you have to put something away and move on mentally because you have a job to do and letting one run in or two runs in or having a bad inning, you can't allow it to spiral. Well, Brandon Neely has shown that and then some in how he's recovered from what could have been a disastrous first inning and was certainly a laborious first inning, and he has been almost perfect since then. One of the other things, obviously, going from that closer role to a starting job like he had his freshman year. And you know, that got Trevor Austin, who has just been a magnet at the plate this year. It's a one-out base run. Been hit by a pitch now 11 times. That's the most of any Tiger. It's on base for the second time, but Neely having to make adjustments because now he's seeing the lineup a second time through, and that's something he's going to have to get accustomed to again. Yeah, I think for both of these pitchers, the second, and if either of them or both of them are out there for the third time through, it's very interesting because for Neely, as you rightly say, not something that he's done a lot in the last uh, almost two years before getting to start last week. And then for Lunsford, he's been throwing the kitchen sink at Florida from the top of the first inning. So even if he's more used to seeing a second and third time through the lineup, he doesn't have a lot of new wrinkles to show. Jackson Lovich back in the order. Walked his first time up, was stranded at second when Mizzou scored one in the first inning, but left the bases loaded. And it takes a strike to even the count. Still hitting 322 on the year. So again, an OPS over 1,000. Was here last year, he didn't play much. His brother was here before he transferred out to Arkansas. Big hole on the right side of the infield right now. And if you're Brandon Neely, you're out there, you can't feel like there's too much pressure on you because you know you got the bats behind you in this Florida very potent offense. And you're dealing with the Mizzou offense that in SEC play has just been consistently stymied as Lovich punches one right back up the middle, a base hit. Third hit tonight for Mizzou. And Lovich aboard for the second straight time in his return. I think we've seen enough at this point to, to say that for whatever reason, at least the top four in Missouri's order are handling nearly okay. Lovich, you know, he's got that big wrap on his uh, left hand and thumb, but that was a, a smooth looking swing. Didn't try to do too much with it. Just right back up the middle. The question I think Max is going to be uh, just as it was in the first inning. What can the bottom half of the lineup do if the top half of the lineup guys are on base to bring them in? The pier bus right through. Not a good effort there from the freshman center fielder on the first attempt. And he squared too early for that to be bunting for a hit. And a sacrifice just makes no sense to me in this circumstance. Yeah, you're trying to get second and third with I mean, two outs for what would be your six-hole hitter. 
Swinging away this time and grounds it weakly towards Caglione at first, who still has not made an error in this 2024 season. And now there's two away. I guess that basically is a sack fun if you wanted it. And, and the that reason up J.D. It, Hernandez. The reason it doesn't make a lot of sense is that you don't get the benefit of getting a guy to third with fewer than two outs. First and second with nobody out, I think, is is one of the only, I mean, I, I don't think, I know, is one of the only situations yeah. statistically where you can make a strong argument that a sacrifice bunt makes sense. Still, it's maybe a bit dubious against such a good offensive team because I don't know that two or three runs, as Hernandez couldn't check his swing, that two or three runs is going to be enough to beat Florida. I think you have to play for more than that. But you could make the argument. First and second with one out, I don't think there's any statistical data-driven argument for a bunt. Hernandez weakly grounds one to Shelton. And the off-balance throw in time. And Mizzou has now stranded five through the first. And we're thrilled to be joined by Florida head coach Kevin O'Sullivan. And Coach, what does your team have to do second time through the order trying to make adjustments against Logan Lunsford? Uh, I think just be on time for the fastball. It looks like, you know, maybe getting hit in the hand there may have affected his ability to spin the ball. But, uh, you know, most importantly, we got to hit the ball on the line because obviously the ball's not traveling, you know, like it does sometimes here. Hey, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Once for sticking with the fastball, it was pitch number 50 of his outing so far. Dealt with this part of the lineup brilliantly first time through. The top four guys 0 for 5 combined right now. This is 2 3 4. Evans, Caglione, and Shelda. Lunsford's got three strikeouts so far through the first three innings. And he'll get another a breaking ball that bounced way out in front of home plate. Gets the chase from Evans, who's came for his second time. He's doing it all different ways, Lunsford. And, you know, it's interesting. I don't want to belabor the sequencing, but it almost becomes more important because to the point of all the different things that they've shown, that he's shown Florida hitters already, now it becomes, if, if you're going to have to show him the same pitches, show him in different ways. Maybe he's feeling a little bit better because you just heard Coach O'Sullivan talk about he's having a little trouble spinning the ball. Well, that was a breaking ball, and, and while it did land maybe two feet, not at least a foot and a half out in front of home plate, still able to get the chase from Evans. As Caglione jams one on the ground towards first. And, and to that point, I mean, Ty Evans is a good hitter, right? It, he's not, if, if there's not good spin on that ball, he's not chasing a pitch that lands that far in front of home plate. It's it's the spin on the ball that creates it, makes it still look deceptive rather than just being spiked. Though I think that's a kind of pitch that even regardless of the spin on it, Ty Evans does not often chase and he'll be frustrated that he did. Two balls and a strike. Okay, we all hit 397 entering this weekend series. Not underneath it. Not out of play. You can check out just how well he's doing in the conference. I mean, a guy with this much power producing a 397 average, that's sixth best. How many hits? 14 home runs is tied for third. That's maybe even beneath uh, the standards that he set a year ago. 2-2 Two -two from Lunsford. That's how he spins it, but Kangleon does tank it. You mentioned the, that he's managed to improve on his already gaudy numbers from a year ago. You know what really stands out to me? More walks than strikeouts this season. 3-2 coming. Chopped over towards Culbertson. Tough play all the way across the diamond, not nearly a tough. And you got to shift love that. on, and that's just a job well done. Tip your hat to Jack Caglione, who gets his first hit of the series. I think that's, first of all, he has the athletic, the bat control to just sort of put, put the barrel on it and let the ball go over there with two strikes. Second of all, he has the athleticism to get down the line pretty well for a big guy. Third of all, he's unselfish enough to do that. A guy who hit 33 home runs last year has 14 already this season, just went 491 in the midweek as that pitch comes in and, and hits Shelton is willing with two strikes to say, I'm just going to put the ball in play to the left side, knowing that if I keep this on the ground, I most likely have an infield hit. I, I think, uh, you know, obviously he knows he's going to be a high draft pick one way or the other, especially assuming he stays healthy. But for a guy with all that on him to still be willing to swing small when he feels the moment calls for it, that, that reflects to me a real commitment to the team. His 33 home runs last year were a program record, also a BB core era. 
D1 record. Now there's two on with just one out. And Lunsford just allowed the first hit of his outing here with one down in the fourth inning, an infield single, and then plucked Tyler Shelnut right in the back. And now he's got Kate Curley. Curley walked his first time up. This is the biggest threat that Florida has had so far tonight. This is the first time they've had a man in scoring position. And that fastball still got a whole lot of life to it. Interesting to see if Lutzford can continue to have this kind of success over the next few innings. Umazu goes to first out of that bullpen if they still go to Rustad as that's chopped up the middle. Could be two, four to six to three. A base hit. The most difficult jam he's had to deal with on the mound. Now he gives it right back to the junior on the other side and Brandon Neely. He's hung a couple of zeros in a row. He's been pitching from the stretch a whole lot here in game one. His next pitch will be number 60. Stranded three in the first, stranded two in the third. And he's facing a guy in Matt Garcia. If anybody in this series could use a base hit, it's Matt Garcia, who is 0 for 28 to start SEC play so far. He's a guy who, like we've talked about, a ton of success in the midweek. He's had hits in six straight midweek games. He was all over the base pass up Tuesday and Wednesday, but it just has not translated this year. Garcia pops one out, shallow center field. Guy coming in, and there's one down, making 0 for 28. Max, I, you know, I got to be careful about uh, belaboring my soapboxes, but if there's one thing I feel passionate about at this time of year, it's reminding people that midweeks, non-conference in general, is not the SEC. And I think once we're three weekends in, now game 10 of the SEC season, if it were up to me, if I were the czar of all things college baseball television... And we all wish that you were. You wouldn't be allowed to show any non-conference stats. It'd be SEC stats only for me because it's just a different thing. And the funny thing is, I mean, you talked about Florida being number six, even though they're 17 and 11. They've had a lot of success in SEC play, but they, you know, barely edged out on Tuesday. Florida a and it was 10 to 7. That put to bed a five-game midweek losing streak. So they've almost been playing the reverse of Missouri, who's been having their only kind of success in the midweek. And again, you made the point that probably some of it is, you know, the defending national runner-up and, and the just incredible consistency that they've had under Kevin O'Sullivan. They're getting respect to be number six. I think the other thing is polls that are determined by humans, such as the D1 baseball poll, as opposed to RPI, understand, even if we don't say it out loud that often, that midweeks are just not the same thing. And a team struggling in midweeks doesn't indicate they're going to struggle in the postseason. And Florida's gone out there, you know, down in the Sunshine State, they they played Florida State, right? They played Miami. Yeah, they're only two against series. Florida State. I would yeah. think they'd like to at least salvage something, but it's the Tallahassee game that's left. I got that coming up after this weekend. Set is done. Two two to Colbertson. Rolled on the ground and it's booted by Colby Shelton. And this Florida defense does not make mistakes. Just their 17th error of the season. Fourth in the nation entering the weekend in fielding percentage at 984. It's a weird one, too. I mean, it's a turf infield, so you don't think there's any odd hop. And it's a long bounce, too. I mean, he just kind of picked his glove up on it, and I don't know really why. I wouldn't think he would have been in a major hurry. You know, Culbertson runs fine, but it's not like you have Curtis getting down the line. So I, I don't know. That's a funny one. It just happens sometimes. Colby Shelton, I mean, what a job he has done. You think about all the power this Florida team lost from last year. Obviously, Wyatt Lankford, the headliner, and then you lose two key cogs in the starting rotation. But, I mean, their shortstop last year, Josh Rivera, was fantastic. It's a guy who is starting opening day at minor league baseball today at double-A Tennessee. And they have not missed a beat with Colby Shelton out there on either side. His bat's been incredible. He's batting leadoff now, and his defense has been sublime. Now, how about how quickly some of these guys, these these high-end college guys, are starting to move through the minor leagues? It's crazy. And Wyatt mean, Langford obviously is the is the easiest one to point to. And certain organizations, you know, throw them to more aggressive spots than others. I mean, the Angels are pretty much starting anybody drafted in the first few rounds. It feels like in Double A. Rock Daniels ahead in the count, two and zero. 
homered in back-to-back -back games. Nine RBIs in the last two. Chance to turn this lineup card over with maybe a couple of guys on for Jarrett Curtis, who tripled way back to start this game with the first inning and scored the lone run. Four-pitch walk. It's an E6, then a base on balls to the eight and nine hitter. And that is not. We got the reigning SEC freshman of the week at the back end of the bullpen now, too, as Curtis fouls away the first pitch home. Yeah, I would imagine Kevin O'Sullivan felt a little bit of pressure to make sure they got at least a midweek win, considering how the, those games have been going. That was another comeback win, too. They've had nine total this year, six in conference play. And the last three wins have all been via comeback fashion. It's just difficult for me to know how to treat those midweek games, right? On the one hand, I think anybody who watches a lot of college baseball knows that even for high-end SEC teams, the midweeks just look a lot different, especially from a pitching standpoint. Nobody has the pitching to throw out. No, you're throwing freshmen. Guys. That's that's where they're getting their innings. Here. Right, and and so at that point, it does make sense in my mind intuitively to just undermine their value a little bit. On the other hand you got to win the games. What do we have to measure other than how do you play when you're actually out there on the field? But but to me, who you are on the weekend is most likely who you are in the postseason, unless you get in some kind of crazy regional with multiple extra inning games where you're having to go to the very depths of your bullpen. The guys you throw in a three-game series are the guys you're going to use in the postseason. Curtis switched on one low and outside, two and two the count. I think a lot of people would argue that the midweek games can be a differentiating factor in terms of who's going to be a national seed, who's going to be, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's the eight and is hosting versus the nine and not? Certainly. I think my point is if there's such a disconnect between Florida being number six in the country in the D1 baseball poll. 2-2 two -two to Curtis, blooped in the shallow center, down for a base hit. Guy plays it on a couple of hops, throw comes all the way in. You see him on cork a howitzer. Station to station, bases loaded for the second time for the Tigers. Jarek Curtis is a bat that Garrick Jackson talked about. He's been really pleased with what he's seen from the transfer from Texas. Guys, a chance to bust this thing wide open. And he takes the ball. He even grounded out to second his first time up, produced the game's lone run. As he drove it, Curtis from third, struck out, looking his last time up. It's a great bounce back pitch. We mentioned it earlier that for Missouri, the, the story's been the top half of the order getting on base and the bottom half not able to capitalize on those scoring opportunities. In this case, it's the bottom of the order that started the rally. Beeman flares one up towards second. This is going to be routine. And now there's two away for Trevor Austin. Can't get the job done. The situational hitting's been kind of lacking here so far. Yeah, that's a, a, a situation where you... You'd like seeing the ball hit in the air because if you can get it out to the outfield with uh, you know average depth or better, you expect to have a good chance of uh, of scoring Culbertson. But uh, if it's going to be on the infield, you'd rather see it on the on the ground. And we'll, we can talk to Kerry Jackson about that when we get him uh, on our airwaves coming back for the fifth. Austin grounds on Weekly right back to the mound, and Neely works his magic again. Graham and Coach, what have you seen so far from Logan Lunsford, especially since he got hit with that comebacker? Again, just him being a competitor, right? Like he's going to battle uh, and battle through adversity. And he's a guy that's going to come out there. And every time he goes out there, he gives us his best. He's gotten away with a couple of hanging change-ups. And hopefully we can get those down. And But he's been attacking the zone and taking advantage of some of their weaknesses. So hopefully he's going to continue to roll and do that. Coach, you've had traffic on the base pass in the first four innings. But uh, eight men left on base. What, if anything, do you want to see change in those runners in scoring position opportunities? Just under for our guys to understand that they need to stay in their plan. He hasn't gotten our guys out in their plan yet. And they've expanded that and chased. And it's ended up in us not capitalizing. Coach, I want to ask you one more question before we let you go. And that is, you, you talked to us about Jarrett Curtis and how pleased you've been with him. We know he left the game on Wednesday. But he's starting today. And he's looking great at the plate. And he looks like himself. He's made tremendous strides. Um, you know, it's a guy that didn't play a lot last year. Uh, he's opened himself up to, to understanding what we want to do from a coaching standpoint to get him to make some adjustments. He's made those, and you're seeing the results. Thanks so much, Coach. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you, MIZ. Bledsford facing Luke Heyman. And it paints the inside corner. Ball at two strikes. 
Maybe it's still got probably the hardest hit ball of the night so far. The line shot, the leap of grab at third from Trevor Austin. This is his second time facing the sophomore right-hander. And from an exit velo standpoint, the only other one that stands out is probably Caglione's fly ball to, to pretty deep center his first time up, but I doubt that was hit as hard as the, the line drive by Heyman, who just can't catch a break. Deep breath from Lutz for the 2-2. Grounded back over towards Austin. Stop fields it on the ground and fires over with plenty of time. And I think all the kids in attendance, anytime Caglione's played on the road, especially, I feel like, and hits the ball in the air, everybody in attendance is going to get pretty excited on the edge of their seats. I, I think I fell into that as well, but sent one out to the warning track at center here. He hits that ball on Tuesday or Wednesday. It's probably out for home run number 15. And we talked about it uh, off the air. The Florida brand is so strong and I think so appealing to, to the kids also that they're always excited to come out and see the Gators anytime they come to Columbia. It's uh, the only time, and I see it frequently. I can never remember it with any other school where it's not unusual to see a parent wearing Mizzou stuff and a kid wearing Florida stuff. Who were, the kid's clearly from Columbia, right? Grew up with Mizzou fan parents and still liked Florida. I think that shows you the power of the Gators brand. They've made it to the College World Series eight times under Coach Kevin O'Sullivan, the 2017 national champs, the runners up from a year ago. A lot of kids out here at the ballpark tonight. There's, there's one wearing his orange sweatshirt and Florida hat next to a Mizzou fan buddy. I don't know what that, that was. Is that spun in there for strike three called? It's the third backwards K in the fifth of the night already for Logan Lutzford. You know, he looked for those that first batter or two after he had the comebacker off his pitching hand. Max, like, he might have been affected by it, and, and it was going to be a struggle for him. He settled back in nicely, and if he's struggling, you really can't tell. He's spinning it brilliantly as he's got the eight hole hitter Tanner Garrison up now. He's trying to work through five shutout innings at home against the number six team in the country. I don't think it got the front foot. It did. Nothing in two. So Lunsford, talk about all the strikeouts he piled up last year. His season high this year came last Friday against Vandy when he punched out five. So he has now matched that total. He can surpass it right here, though. And Garrison struck out swinging his first time up. 0-2 coming. Staying alive is Tanner Garrison. Once for last week, gave up four runs, but only two were earned in his five innings of work at Vandy down in Nashville, but his team didn't score. They got blank 4 nothing that night. Guy was only got three pitches, but when you read the scouting report and you see him, it's all about the sequencing for him, and the sequencing has been brilliant. Him and Hernandez at Tim Jamison have all really been in sync tonight. Harrison skies one back behind home plate and out of play. Harrison did play on Tuesday, but over the weekend, four for seven, a home run, a couple of RBIs. Started all three games at Mississippi State. And a swing and a miss and a new season high. Six strike. Fourth inning. Florida's got to be pretty pumped. It's only one nothing at the moment, but Neely is back out there. Through 82 pitches last Friday, this will be pitch number 82 today. Tying a season high right here as he throws a strike to Jackson Lovich. You're going to put a silver lining on it from a Florida standpoint. It shows that Kevin O'Sullivan has confidence in how Neely's getting stretched out, though. Like even pitch low and outside, and that's huge for them down the stretch if they are going to go with him over Kane Fisher and throw the lefty out of the bullpen for him to get stretched out. So we head towards the middle of the SEC portion of the season. And I think this would qualify as stretched out already. The fact that oh, he's yeah. being allowed to go out there for a fifth inning with his pitch count already at 80, and he's thrown at least the one really high intensity inning. And he tied up Jackson Lovich. Strikeout number three. 
And I think that's important to, to keep in mind as well. For for a while, you get another look at the, uh, the fastball inside, just right under the hands of Lovich, no chance. For a while, we got into just raw pitch count. Then coaches would talk to you about up-downs, the number of times that a pitcher was having to sit down and get back up and, and start pitching again. And then it became it's become more popular recently to talk about those high-stress innings because 80 pitches spread evenly at, say, 16 an inning over five innings is not the same as one inning where you throw 36 pitches like Neely did in the first. So the fact that Kevin O'Sullivan and the staff feel confident enough in his arm and where he is physically to even after a 36 pitch first inning send it back out there to to climb its pitch count into the 90s in the fifth inning is is a really good sign here just got plunked two hit batsman last friday and that's the second today as well for the right hander one out base runner peer aboard for the first time and how about high stress i mean not just the quantity but how many pitches he's had to throw with not just one guy on base but Two guys on base. The bases have been loaded in two of the first four innings. That's the other thing. Mentally, he's done a great job of not allowing difficulties to spiral and get worse and worse. And that's a, a core trait of a good starter. Yeah, as, as well as a good guy coming into the back of the bullpen, you know, when he's going to have to come in and maybe the eighth inning or even the seventh inning in college to go get a long save, maybe get you five to seven outs, coming in with guys on base. And he's been maybe at his best today with the bases loaded. No one to Hernandez. That was a wild swing. The second thing is, to your point about the guys on base, stereotypically, late-inning relievers are not very good with guys on base. They don't control the running game well. They're not always super comfortable out of the stretch. Neely has looked totally fine out of the stretch and great with runners on base. And I think it's gotten even harder to control the running game in the era of the pitch clock because you can't do as long a hold as you want to or the multiple look overs You bring it down to one, guys know you're going home, too. Right. Huge thing. If you do want to do the long hold, you have to get your sign quickly. Hernandez, Tarnio, heads up. That doesn't seem to be an issue at all for him. Again, stereotypically, those late-inning relievers tend to be the slower workers, the high-leverage guys. Not the case at all for Neely. Do have a lefty loose hitting in the bullpen. You would imagine that's Cade Fisher. Pitch count over 90. He's worked a season long, four and a third, and thrown a season high 93 pitches. He can match his season high with a fourth strikeout right here. If he can get the catcher, J.D. Hernandez, who walked and grounded out to third so far. Stays alive again. Matt Garcia on deck, 0 for 2. Mizzou, they got to feel like so far through just about five complete innings, they have really outplayed Florida, but they don't have much to show for. Just the one run. And Hernandez is doing everything in his power right now to fight these off. He spoiled a few good ones. He's been really late on some fastballs, too, but choking up a bit. Being a tough out here in the six hole. He sprays one out to shallow center, late break. Guy sprinting in, lays out, and makes the grab. Hung in the air just long enough. Guy, we've seen the arm strength and now the speed. You mentioned late break. I don't think Guy got a good jump on this at all. Well, this would be a good look from this angle. He takes his initial drop step with his right foot and leaves himself a lot of work to do with the ball closing in. That's a really great play, great catch. Good hustle as well from left field by Shell, not if it got by him, but it's a good ball to take a chance on because there's some air under it. It's not hit that hard. So even if it gets by him, the, the downside risk is relatively low. With the sunglasses coming off his face right as he makes contact with the turf, too. That was a fantastic play. We haven't had a lot of highlights so far in this game. It, no. It's felt a little bit like a slog for both teams, even though it's been close. That was a phenomenal catch. We haven't had many hard hit balls whatsoever, and that's really the second nice defensive play as that did hit Matt Garcia. It's the second hit batsman of the inning. And, well, in Brandon Neely's final inning, on Friday, he hit two batters. Give Neely a shot at this Friday night roll. Drew Colbert's in. Boy, that looked just like the pitch to Jackson Lovich. Just nothing you can do. That's a sword right there, and it's 0-1. 
So Neely has stranded eight through the first four innings. He's trying to strand two more here. Pitch number 100 coming. Tough kid, electric atmosphere, or electric uh, personality, I should say. He's never going to want to come out of a game. Trying to drop down a bunt for a base hit with two on and two away. Now you're down one two with a guy who has not had his control today and especially in this inning. Not sure about that one. Culbertson hit a ground ball over towards Colby Shelton that short his last time up and reached on the E6. Pitch number 102 for Brandon Neely coming. Still got life on the fastball, 92. For a guy who was the closer last year and has been in the bullpen almost the whole year. Just impressive that he's been able to maintain it for so long. 2-2. Two -two. In the air, out to shallow center. Much easier this time for Guy. A deja vu for Brandon Neely, who has left 10 oh, very effectively these last couple of innings. So Florida, to start the sixth inning, will go left versus right and have the advantage at the plate as Jalen Guy is removed for Armando Albert, who came in. And chops one right back over towards Drew Culbertson. And so far, Florida at the plate tonight, one for 16. I mean, nobody has hit well today. These two teams combined with two outs are 0 for 9. Mizzou is 1 for 9 with men in scoring position. Florida's only had one at bat with a man at second or third today, and they're 0 for 1. The good news for Florida is they're starting the third time through the order with Colby Shelton here, the leadoff man. The bad news is I would think this is the kind of night where it's easy to start pressing, start over swinging. Good change up again. And you can see why Florida might do that, right? We told you at the beginning, 61 home runs, tied for sixth in Division One. They got guys at the top of this order in particular who can mash the baseball. But against a guy like Lunsford who has his, his changeup working like that, that's the exact pitch you want to be throwing against a lefty who might be over swinging. And it's, a, it's not a great weather night to try to go deep. So I, I don't think Florida wants to be swinging big. Shelton goes down swinging. Three straight whiffs. Another K for Lunsford. It's been a tough night for Shelton who put an end to his 18 straight games without an error. And now he's 0 for 3 with two Ks. And he just threw the same pitch three times in a row. That's three straight change-ups. You can watch his hand, how it turns over, and the ball kind of looks like it's coming out of the open palm. That's a textbook change-up sign. Seven Ks. He has just been filthy. And maybe the man who's had the most struggles against him is Ty Evans, the man at the play. And after one swing, he's going to get a little talking to here. I'm sure I've even seen that before ever. It's sort of innocuous, but I don't think I've seen that happen. Maybe just trying to break the rhythm, if anything, because you just had the whole half inning, the inning break, I should say, to, to talk with your hitters. And Ty Evans is a strike away from Kane for a third time, and well, I think Lunsford knew what he swung at last time with two strikes and tried to throw it a little bit even closer to himself. That was maybe 56 feet. We told you Lunsford's fastball heavy. That's six straight off-speed pitches. And now the crowd is getting anxious. That's why you have to have three, right? As a starter, you need your fastball for everybody. You need a curveball to throw to hitters of the same handedness as you, a changeup to the opposite hand. 2-2. Two, two. Yes, he did. Strike three. Logan Lutzford has ever. Five Ks as well. A left to you comes at you with kind of a crossfire delivery. And light shot the other way. And there it is. Brock Daniels gets his first hit of the day. I'm going to tell you, Max, uh, you know, Cade Fisher's stats just don't make sense. I don't think you're going to find many pitchers who both strike out 14, 15 batters per nine innings and have strikeout to walk ratio better than five to one and yet still give up more than a hit per inning. 
just not many guys have the stuff to strike out that many guys and the command to limit walks that well and also get hit as often as he does. Jerry Curtis almost just got hit. But yeah, it's crazy and you expect a guy with his stuff and really his command, like you noted, to figure things out. He should miss more bats than he does and I, I wish I could tell you why he hasn't been. And he's got he's got two outings this year where he struck out double digits. His, they got the runner off of first and Daniel sprinting for second. He's in there as it skips into left field. Boy, with Curtis up, Garrison throws over to Caglione and Brock Daniels looked like he was a, a sitting duck. He made the wise move to just, his only prayer was to go to second. He did, and that's a tough throw for a lefty to make. Yeah, but it's not but as tough, tough as, for anybody it's not as tough as Caglione made it look there. That's got to stay on the same side of the bag. That was just calamitous for both teams. Yeah, that was uh, a bit of an eyesore. So credit Daniels with a stolen base, and well, Mizzou is trying to play small ball, and they pretty much just gifted a free 90 feet to a team that was trying to bunt. Still trying to bunt, but maybe try to field it himself. <laughs> Oh, Curtis is really lucky. That ball is in foul territory. Not by I think much. When he touches it, but he intentionally grabs at the baseball, and Calvin O'Sullivan is is making the point that this ball might have been in fair territory. To no avail. By the way, so it's stolen base, so no error for Caglione. That would have ended a very lengthy 48 games in a row without an error for the first base. But here's another look at it. Look how far down on the barrel that right hand is. Keep in mind as well that home plate is fair territory. He is very fortunate because that could have been over top of home plate. It's just a judgment call for the umpire. There it is. Strikes out anyways. So the stolen base didn't move Daniels up to second base, but Curtis can move him no further. Up steps Jackson Beeman, who's got the lone RBI in this game today. Just for anybody wondering, that not a reviewable play, that fair or foul call, because uh, the ball did not strike the ground or a fielder beyond the initial position of the corner infielder. Tardy on a first pitch, fastball at 90 miles an hour. Jackson Beeman, 0 for 3 today. Ground out, strike out, Papa. Pitcher's duel here at game one of three at Como. Florida has not pitched well at all. We saw the numbers earlier. Brandon Neely was playing with fire all night long, but those five innings allowing just the one run. That's a massive insurance run. I know it's only the sixth inning to be. We talking about insurance, but the way that Logan Lunsford's going on the other side, and the way that both offenses, quite frankly, I mean, combined six hits, and Florida has just one right now. Nothing's being hit hard as Beeman also goes down swinging. And it's back to back K's for the man at second. Kate Fisher looked uh, really confident, especially these last couple of pitches. Got the breaking ball for a strike. Then goes up and blows Beeman away with a fastball. We talked about how Neely struggles to locate his breaking stuff for a strike. Missouri now against Fisher, more likely to have to honor both speeds, and that's going to be a challenge. Now it's up to a guy at Trevor Austin who's been out there every single game so far this year. Started every game last year. Looking for a clutch base hit. Has been one of the best players on this team over the last few years. Lifts with down the right field line. It's going to curl out of play. Oh, it's to the count to the three hole hitter. To your point as well about the insurance, even though Florida has struggled offensively in this game, and even though we talked in the last half inning about how you don't want to press and try to hit the long ball, this is a team more than capable of running into one or more. You don't want to go into the late innings against Florida with the Gators just a bloop and a blast from beating you. Austin chops one over to Shelton, who bobbles it again, regathers, not in time. I think Florida's going to want to look at this. Kevin O'Sullivan already is signaling. For Kids at home, that is why he hit the front of the base. After review, the call of safe at first base will stand. Well, there you have it. It'll go E6, second error on 
the very sure-handed shortstop Colby Shelton puts Austin at first puts Brock Daniels at third continues the inning for the cleanup hitter Jackson Lovich and this is probably a spot he was chopping at the bit to get up for up by a run a chance to increase the lead you've missed the last seven games due to injury you've been the most dangerous hitter for this team in 2024. You've got a left on right matchup too. Cade Fisher at his first hitting out of the pad after Brandon Neely went five. Lovich has walked, singled, and struck out. Yeah. These are nervy moments here at Como. Mizzou has stranded multiple runners in three straight innings. Two balls and no strikes. They stranded two in the third, three in the fourth, two in the fifth to go with Lee with the bases loaded in the first inning. Lovich the best hitter average-wise on this Tigers squad. Ahead in the count, and he rolls one to the left side. It's sliding from the third baseman over to second for the out. Nice play, Dale Thomas. Mizzou strats two more. Check. First pitch swinging, cues it over to short. And Culbertson makes the play just in the nick of time. Second time in a row, he sent a chopper that way. The last time, infield single. That was the lone base hit still for the Gators today. Yeah, you wouldn't have bet on Caglione infield single as Florida's only hit through six and a third innings. The last one was a little bit farther toward third base, so it was a longer run for Culverton and maybe a little bit softer hit. He also might have been playing a bit deeper, but Caglione can get down the line, especially for a guy of his size. So that was a good play by Culverton, even though it was sort of simple, it had to be clean. Now the cleanup hitter, Tyler Shelna. He takes low. Rustan last time out. Pitch versus Vandy. Six innings, allowed three runs. Didn't walk a batter at Kane five. Big difference tonight have been the free passes issued by Florida and not issued by Mizzou. I mean, Neely hit three and walked three. But maybe the biggest storyline so far is Mizzou's inability to hit in the clutch with men in scoring position. You have stranded 12 men through six innings, which is just unheard of, especially for a team that really hasn't had that kind of opportunity with guys on base consistently in SEC action. And maybe foreign territory. 2-1 coming. In there in the count, he beats up. Shellnut was hit by a pitch his last time up. You can tell Rustan was a starter. He squares you up and pitches from the windup with nobody up. 2-2. Two -two. Strike three call. 92 miles an hour with the fastball. His first punch out of the night. Missouri pitchers are thrown with confidence. And, you know, we talked to Kerry Jackson this week, and he said you need them not to put too much pressure on themselves, right? They pitched well, ERA under 2.7 over the weekend against Vanderbilt. There's pitching coach Tim Jamison. And you need them not to try to be too perfect because they feel like they're not going to get a lot of offensive support. You have to just go out and do your job. And one of the things he said in particular was you can't try for the shutout. You can't force yourself to be that perfect because a shutout's not realistic. You hope for it, but a shutout's not realistic. Well, it might be realistic now tonight, which nobody would have seen coming. And maybe more than that, it might be necessary if Missouri's going to win this game. And I think you and I both, because I, you know, I posed the question. I felt like, you know, looking at the numbers and having watched this team like we have throughout the spring, you'd expect this pitching staff, especially the weekend starters, to be feeling some pressure because you give up a couple of runs, maybe even just three runs, and it feels like this team has been out of games, having allowed just that few, as it's three and zero now. But Logan Lunsford, I mean, no signs that he was feeling any type of pressure tonight. Maybe his best outing is a Tiger. Rustad trying to. Picking up where he left off. Trying to find the zone, and he does. Kate Kerwood, the second baseman, a walk at a ground ball double play. 
He was up in their biggest threat inning in the fourth with men at first, did second and one out. And bounced out four, six to three. And he hammers one out to center field that's going to hang up in the air for Caden Peer. Florida just last series against Mississippi State. So if you're Mizzou, you feel like, I mean, even just one run could do wonders for this team if they want to come out with a win here in the open. I think just to give themselves a little bit more confidence as well, because they, there has to be some tightness in that dugout, especially because they've squandered so many opportunities to increase the lead while Florida has struggled to even get guys on base. It's now 10 in a row retired by Missouri pitching. No two to appear low and away. The other interesting thing, and this is you know looking ahead a little bit, Florida's going to have Heyman, Thomas, and Garrison in the eighth, and then they'd be scheduled to have Michael Robertson, who's taken over in center field, batting for the first time in the nine hole. As Pierre goes down swinging, three strikeouts already through an inning and a third for Kane Fisher. He's looked really good. Then the top of the order would be up, Kobe Shelton and Ty Evans, but that's all Florida's guaranteed right now. Get another look. I mean, the difference here, and it's what makes Fisher, I think, a good backup to Neely, is that, well, not backup, but a good follow up to Neely. Yeah is that he's forcing Missouri to honor both the fastball and the slider for a strike. And, and I think Missouri now is having to deal with those different velocities, which they really didn't against Neely. They were able to sit on the fastball because he wasn't locating anything else consistently. And a six foot four lefty coming after you, after what we saw from Brandon Neely, the hard throwing righty, the crossfire motion, the breaking ball is nasty. Now, there's a lot to like to, to me about this Friday night tandem. And it's funky because really both teams on at least this Friday night and potentially going forward are kind of going starter to starter. Right? Because Mizzou's doing it, Lutzford to Rustad, and Neely to Fisher is pretty much the same. Fisher came in, gave up a single to Brock Daniels. It's the first boundary faced last inning. Since then, strikeout, strikeout, had the ground ball error, and the ground ball out, then another strikeout. As that's crushed in the air off the bat of Hernandez. On its way, and it is off the wall. Extra bases for the catcher as he stands up at second with a one-out double. You know, I was going to make the comment, Max, that Hernandez has taken some really big swings tonight. We saw it his last at bat. We saw it in this one as well. He is not afraid to cut it loose. I think maybe sometimes to his detriment, and that's the context in which I was going to make the comment earlier. But then even with two strikes, he takes a big cut at a slider that just stayed over the heart of the plate. And he does a really good job there driving with the back leg. He got down on the plane of the pitch. And he gave this a ride again, maybe on a different day. This is a ball that gets out. Instead, it just bangs off the bottom of the wall on the fly. And uh, Missouri has that potential insurance run in scoring position. Just the second extra base hit of the day. And that's all the way to the backstop. Now, most likely, you're going to have to bring the entire infield in. Again, just the unforced errors for Florida. Two literal errors, plus six free bases they've given away from walks and hit batsmen. And now a critical wild pitch. I was, again, not understanding why Missouri would bunt as Garrett Jackson's calling timeout to bring Garcia over to him. Doesn't make sense to me there to try to bunt a guy to third, giving away your second out. But maybe it just threw Fisher off a little bit, and Florida just gave away that critical 90 feet for free without forcing Missouri to use its second out. What do you think that Carrick Jackson is imploring these guys right now? You got Janie Hernandez, the transfer at third. You got Matt Garcia, a veteran at the plate who's been clutch in big moments at the walk-off single here last year versus Vandy. And this is a run you feel like they kind of desperately need standing at third with just one out. To me, especially because Hernandez is a guy who maybe plays with a little bit more of a variable heart rate rather than the consistent heart rate, <laughs> I'd want to give him specific instruction. And, and to me, that would mean you're going on contact. We're going to take the risk, force Florida with how nervy they've been defensively to make a clean play here. Matt Garcia, the switch hitter in the seventh spot, batting from the right side for the first time today. Remember, started the year exclusively from the left side with the hammock bone injury. Back to switch hitting in front of the count, 2 and up. Checks up and did not go. That's a really good take by Garcia because, especially ahead 2 and 0, even if that pitch were somehow called a strike, that's not one you want with a guy at third and one out here. He wants something either at his belt that he can get in the air or down that he can hit on the ground. 
And it's a four pitch walk. Men at the corners now, still one out, up steps Drew Culbertson. Garcia runs well at first. You'd imagine the third baseman would play in. That's what we're seeing from Dale Thomas. Shelton and Curlin at double play depth up the middle. And Anglio naturally going to have to hold on Matt Garcia. But you got good speed at first. You got good speed at the plate. Not so great speed in the form of the catcher at third. Same idea. I would expect Garcia to be on the move early in this at bat. Probably the first pitch for me. And I would think if the th if Florida throws down and it flies Fisher, the pitcher, I would tell Hernandez to go. Culbertson tries to bunt one down the first baseline, but kind of just reached out and tried to stab it as opposed to dented it. It's a foul ball. We've seen Culbertson square the bunt a few times already. And by the way, now in seven innings, six of the seven, Mizzou has now had multiple guys reach base, still just the one run. Again, I don't totally love the bunt just because I, it feels like something that Florida is going to expect in this situation. I would want to force them to do something that they can't be prepared for. Colbert's it swinging away and he takes a strike. I just don't know why you would wait to send Garcia. You're just going to put Florida under pressure right away. The last thing they want to do is try to make two throws across the entire infield down to second and back. 0-2. It's one low, the true freshman from Greenwood, Indiana. Really been a struggle. The eight year one for Drew Culbertson at the plate so far. Garcia goes from first. Fink on the throw down. They finally do send him. He's in there with the stolen base. And that's exactly what I mean. That's a free 90 feet, and it's been free for four pitches. There was no reason not to take it on one of the prior pitches because if Culbertson gets a hit now, Missouri likely scores two runs instead of one, and whatever remote double play possibility there was is out, so they have to bring the infield in. Culbertson takes outside, looking like a veteran here, working the count back full. The freshman in the eight hole so far in his first year of SEC action, he is just one for 20 with 13 strikeouts. The payoff pitch. Culbertson pops one up, very shallow to the right side. Curlwood going back, makes the call, and the grab. Tougher play because the it field was in, but still a routine pop-up and another opportunity where situational hitting was not done smoothly by Mizzou. Now that's the second time since uh, the midpoint of the game that Missouri's had a man at third base with one out and have hit something in the air. And, in the prior case, it was a little flare. Typical nine hitter, the way he's been swinging it this week. Brock Daniels having one of the weeks of his life so far. Nine RBIs. He's reached base twice already today. Walked and single. And now it's back to back hitters down in 0-2 holes. But that's exactly why you stick with Fisher here in the left-on-left -left matchup because he can come with back-to-back -back sliders and that's going to be a lot more effective against Daniels obviously than it would be against Curtis next or than what McNeely could do with his breaking ball righty against lefty. Mizzou has already stranded 12 men on base today and make it 14. What a job for Cade Fish. Florida themselves, one for 21. They've drawn one walk, they've punched out nine times and this might be what pitch one out is Heyman sends one at foul ground but when maybe aids that one a little bit as Daniels ran out of room even when the wind doesn't look strong like it doesn't tonight balls in the air and foul ground on the first base side of Taylor Stadium just go toward the seats I don't know why maybe it has something to do with the steep drop off of the terrain because we are up on top of a hill that slopes down to the first base side. There's a little bit of wind that's coming in from left field and, and would push that ball to the right uh, as you're standing on home plate, but not as much as it moved. Carter Rustan came in for the seventh, worked a three up, three down, clean inning despite falling behind Curl at 3 0. The ground out, a fly out, and a strikeout. Could hear a grunt on that fastball. 91 on the gun, but not in the zone. Rustan with a 4-8-4 ERA. Four 
And Heyman crushes one way back towards left field, and we are tied. Luke Heyman with his seventh home run of the season, just the second hit of the night for Florida. And we got a brand new ball game here in the eighth. A one run lead simply is not safe against the Florida Gators. 62nd home run of the season as a team, top 10 of the country. And Missouri can rue even more so than they might have been just a few moments ago, those 14 runners left on base. And you got to feel great for Heyman because that kid just cannot catch a break lately. Going back to his line out to third base in his first hurt somebody down there. <laughs> He's got a lot of feelings to let out, and I would too in that situation, Max. I would too, because nothing has gone his way. And now Dale Thomas sends a charge into what? Deep out towards center field. Ballpark will contain it in a diving catch. Caden Pierre, a circuitous route, but finds it at the end of the day. Circuitous route is right. But uh, before we look at that, we got to go back to the home run. Fastball up and in. I mean, it's not a bad pitch. Fastball has a little bit of life on it, but Heyman just gets his bat through the zone really quickly, clears his wrists, and sends that one through the wind and left. Roostad. Uh, yeah, you know when a high fastball is barreled like that, that kind of launch angle. And there's a hit bat spin. Things are starting to unravel a little bit here on Carter Roostad. Tanner Garrison aboard for the nine hole hitter. Coming in for Armando Albert in this nine spot. Takes one in the dirt, almost gone away from Hernandez. But, you know, it might have sounded a little strange last inning in the inning prior. If you haven't been too familiar with these two teams this year and what they've done or, you know, lack of what Missouri has done offensively when we said that the Tigers are playing with fire, leaving all these guys on base, even though they are winning the game. And it was just a matter of time before somebody on Florida caught a barrel. That's what this team does. And when they're only down by one, it only takes one swing, obviously. They got that swing. And now it feels like they have snatched the momentum from a Missouri team that through seven innings has stranded 14 men on base. Had two men on base at least in six of the seven innings offensively. I mean, ridiculous. Yost rolls what towards first. Daniels will field it fair. And tank it himself. It's probably the right decision there, especially because you don't know what's going to happen if you let the ball go by it. But it looked like Daniels for a moment just hesitated, thinking you're giving Garrison second base here. Is it, is, would you rather have the ball go foul, especially with the top of the order coming up? But I, I think you have to just play that baseball as it is and, and take the out. This is a massive at-bat now. This is only the second at-bat tonight for Florida that comes with a man in scoring position. It comes with Colby Shelton at the plate. Lead off hitter with 13 home runs this season. And he takes a fastball strike. He's got to be pumped to not see Logan Lunsford out there who is carving him up. He's 0 for 3 with a couple of Ks. Yeah, I wonder, though, if he stepped in thinking he was going to take a pitch because that was a, a decent one to hit, I think, on the first pitch. High fly ball out to media depth right field. This should do it. Beam in there. Inning over. In Jarrett Curtis. He's got two hits today. That's 25% of the base hits for either team. Got eight total hits. Single to home run for Florida and six knocks for Mizzou. He got the hands to that high fastball. Luke McNeil, you saw the ERA, not stupendous because in his second collegiate outing. He went just two-thirds of an inning, allowed five runs versus Stetson. That roughed up versus Miami and Central Florida as well. But since the St. Mary's appearance, he has been locked in as he buckles at ease of Jarrett Curtis with a nice breaking ball. Hasn't allowed a run since March 9th. Curtis two for four with a single and a triple. And he hits one well out towards center field. The man who just came in and Yost racing back, still going back freshly into the game, makes the grab. They had Yost playing really shallow, and he was put under pressure immediately. Just four pitches into the ball game defensively. Don't they say the ball will find you when you're just in the game? This is hit pretty well by Curtis. A long way for Yost to go. 
He sticks out the glove maybe a oh. little early, and then he just squeezed it enough. Almost that fell hit him. out. Yeah, it hit him in the in the palm of his mitt just a little bit and almost squirted out, but he was able to squeeze it in the webbing. He, uh, in the end, he snow-coned it, even though he, he caught it down on his palm. And if he doesn't make that catch... It's at least a double. It's probably three again for the second time tonight for Jarrett Curtis. I think that's right. Jackson Beam in the batter, only one won the count. Nice ball at 94 for his strike. Beamon's 0 for 4, a couple of Ks so far. Mizzou scored in the first inning. They haven't scored since. Florida just finally got on the board. Barely caught a piece, and maybe a bigger piece of Tanner Garrison. Mentioned, by the way, those three different center fielders. Two of them now have made spectacular catches. I think guys was probably better in a vacuum, but under the circumstances, not only the magnitude of the moment, as you see Garrison feeling up around his throat, but also the fact that Yost had just come into the game, I, I think you could make the argument that Yost was, uh, was similarly good. And he deserves a ton of credit, because that's really hard. They say that a lot of plays, great defensive plays don't happen in the top of the first, the first batter of the game, because everybody just sort of wants to settle in. Well, that was the top of the first for Yost, as far as he's concerned, and, and he went out and got it. Beeman still down 0-2. And he goes fishing. Strike three, two up, two down out of the pen for Luke McNeely. This Mizzou offense feels a little deflated and just nasty from the freshman. Jackson Beeman really never too close there. Trevor Austin leads this team with eight home runs. He climbs it. On base twice, a single and a hit by pitch. Austin single came way back in the first inning. Now you feel like Florida, especially if they can get Austin out here, feel like they would be the favorites going forward here into the ninth inning. They've played so many tight games late and come back from deficits. Two ninth inning comebacks over the weekend. Chance to maybe get to the ninth inning tie. Trevor Austin, though, is the man standing in the way. Eight homers, 21 RBIs. Boy, that looks like a good pitch. Jackson Lovich is on deck, maybe still the most dangerous bat, even after missing the last seven games for this Tigers offense. And that was the home run swing for Trevor Austin. Brandon Neely sat down the side, three up, three down in the second. Mizzou has not gone down in order since. Payoff pitch from the freshman. And a jam shot foul. Florida's had success, it feels like, with the righties tonight, Neely, and now Mick Neely, right on right matchups with that inside fastball in the mid-90s. Pitch number 15 I'm the inning. Austin choking up a bit. And he takes upstairs, ball four. No clean three up, three down inning for Florida. Instead, a chance for Jackson Lovich. Just not too competitive there with the 3-2 offering. And he knew, I think, right out of his hand it was going to be a ball and not one that was too enticing for a veteran hitter like Trevor Austin. Five walks tonight to go with the three hit batsman. Could see right away, Max. He just said, darn. <laughs> and Lovich, did he just get hit in the hand? It looks like he did. And That's unfortunately tough. for him, did that catch him in the thumb? It's the, at least the hand that he has wrapped up. And he looks like he's in a lot of pain, understandably so. Right from the onset, when you saw all the bandage around that thumb, we were worried about what the swing would look like. But just got plunked. We'll have to see it again. Looks like it's more the, the outside of the left hand down by the knob of the bat, I think. Maybe even the wrist. So I guess that's better than the thumb, but still not pleasant. Yeah, anywhere is going to hurt. And when you're all taped up and 
dealing with so much pain over the last couple of weeks. I mean, we were told he was, he's been day-to-day -day for a long time. It's kind of a pain tolerance and how the swing can actually be able to be productive in-game. Well, there's two on base again for Mizzou. And Caden Peer takes a strike. So, I mean, just ludicrous. Two on base in seven of the eight innings, and they have one run. This has been the average, right? They, they've left two runners on per inning tonight. Caden Peer, the freshman with a chance to announce himself for the SEC. And he's down 0-2. Man, at first and second, two outs, eighth inning. Tie game. Mizzou with men in scoring position tonight, just one for 15. And Pierre pulls one, heads up right off the top of the Florida dugout. Maybe that was for Jackson Lovich's left hand. <laughs> Keep your head on a swivel at all times. Even with that big pad we were talking about. Gets on you in a hurry. The chance for McNeely here, he's already refocused to get ahead 0-2 after the walk and hit by pitch. Needs to finish it. And Pierre goes down swinging. Mizzou strands two more. An eight coming up in the bottom of the ninth for Missouri. And first pitch strike for Carter Rustad to Ty Evans. Well, Ty Evans has been so hot at the plate of late. So you just feel like maybe he's a guy who could be a candidate for a late inning magical moment. 0 for 3 with three strikeouts, but entered today hitting 361. And a seven game hitting streak since that was snapped. He is now 0 for his last 10. 1 1 tipped into the mid of Hernandez. Last time Ty Evans went on the road was when they traveled to Baton Rouge, and he was 8 for 15 with two home runs versus LSU in that three-game series. 1-2 coming in the dirt, and I think Rustan has been watching what Lunsford's been able to do against the 2-0 hitter, and that's get him to chase, breaking balls low. Huge batter to begin the ninth inning in a tight game. Went back to the well. Florida has drawn one walk so far today. It came back in the second inning. The payoff pitch. Swing and a miss. Ty Evans punched out for a fourth time tonight. Even against a great hitter like Ty Evans, I do think there's moments where the game calls for a pitcher just to trust his stuff. The one thing you don't want to do there is walk the potential go-ahead run on base to lead off the inning in front of Caglione. So I, I love Roostad just saying, if I'm going to lose, it's going to be because Evans beats me. Mizzou pitchers have punched out 10 as Caglione. Kind of an awkward first swing there. Spray chart of his home runs, courtesy of 643 Charts Synergy. I mean, you see, he could slug it all over the yard. It changed the game with one swing. That's a good spot for Rustam, but it's one and one. Logan Lunsford, six shutout innings, one hit, eight Ks, just the one walk. It's been Rustam since the seventh for Mizzou. Tanglione pulls one on the ground. It's fielded by Daniels. Two away. Huge to get Jack Caglione here in the ninth inning. Was homered in back to back games in seven of the last nine. Caglione, oh, or should be one for four today. Did have the infield single back in the fourth inning. Two outs, nobody on for Tyler Shelda. A swing and a drive way back out towards right field, but the wind knocks it down a bit. baby has got room. It's a long out from Shelnut. A deep breath for Carter Rustad. Mizzou with a chance to walk it off in the bottom of the <laughs> Hernandez has been very aggressive swinging, especially against fastballs up. Though he did turn on one and double off the wall in left center his last time up. 
And he rifles one hot shot gobbled up by Thomas at third. Sets his feet and it's up. Thomas took about four crow hops there. He had time, but almost made me wonder if he was uh, dub mentally double clutching the throw, if you will. But uh, in the end, it, w it was a calm play. He just knew he had all this time. But look at that. That's three, <laughs> maybe four crow hops. Oh, my. And, and he does throw a little bit low in plenty of time still. Hernandez does not run very well, so he had the time. But you, you don't normally see a player take that much. There's shuffle in your feet, and then there's that. Matt Garcia. Is that a flare for the late game aerobics? Had a game-winning home run here versus Ole Miss last year. And the bases loaded. Two-run walk-off single versus Vanderbilt. Still hitless in SEC play, trying to change that, but down to an 0-2 hole. And Garcia is 0 for 29 in conference action so far. Missed the first half full of weeks with the hand injury. Veteran in a big moment. He's taking on a freshman, too, in Luke McNeely, who just looks so much different the last month or so. Yeah, with freshmen at this stage, you can't necessarily look at the numbers from the early part of the season. There's no way this is a 7 ERA guy at this point. Swing and a Macy got him. Three quarters swing and another K. That's three tonight for Luke McNeely. That's easy as you like, really. Gave him the change up the pitch before, came right back with it. They're uh, in the major leagues. They looked at it a couple of years ago and said, what's the best pitch sequence? And, and the most effective was back-to-back changeups. You can throw them well. Guys just are not looking for that second changeup. You can get them lunging out in front, sometimes even better than you can on the first one. Feels like such a dangerous pitch to double up on it that you kind of just assume a pitcher won't. Even but especially the guys who have the more of the circle change style where it's coming off the fingers, off the outside fingers really nicely, and it's got that, that little dip and tail to it. We saw it from Logan Lunsford. McNeely has a little bit of action on his as well. So it's not just pure speed that you're relying on with uh, with a straight change. You got that, that dip and, and tail as well that just makes it a little bit more deceptive, and even if a guy's on it, they don't necessarily square it up. McNeely's 0-2. That's in the dirt. He has not been messing around. He's been living in the zone here with the ninth inning. Got the first two guys out in the eighth inning. Then a walk, then a hit batsman, but struck out Caden Peer to end the threat. Luke McNeely trying to send us to extras at Como. And he will. Back to back strike. Dad is out for inning number four in relief of Logan Lunsford. He misses down low. Mizzou was pretty close there to throwing a one hit shutout, one nothing. They gave up two hits in nine innings, but they did not come away with a nine-inning victory. And he popped him up. Into foul ground is Daniel still coming after it, leaning back. Made it look a little bit more difficult than it was, but an out nevertheless. You say made it look more difficult than it was. I, in my mind, there's no such thing as an easy pop-up over there. There's some, some light tossing going on somewhere in that Mizzou bullpen. <laughs> Can't tell who that is with the with the hoodie on, but it's clear Carter Roosted is the guy, and it's the benefit to having what is essentially a starting pitcher who they can use out of the bullpen in high leverage situations. I would imagine if all goes smoothly, Carrick Jackson would feel comfortable running Roosted out there for at least a fifth inning of relief and maybe more. Luke Heyman shoots one down the left field line, boy. Got a breaking ball and was all over. You know, he's just one for three with that homer. But Heyman hit the ball hard on the line out that Austin leaped to snare back in the second. Hit the ball hard on a ground out to the third baseman, Austin, in the fifth as well. He's seen the ball well against two different Missouri pitchers tonight. First down has thrown as many as six innings this year. That lands that for a strike. Maybe it's on the best day. I think the best at bats consistently of anybody out here for either team tonight. Down in the count, one and two, and he swings right through a fastball. Two outs, nobody on. Dale Thomas is next through Stan, trying to sit down the side in order and match what Luke McNeely just did. I just beat him. A little bit late. Challenge the fastball, caught a good amount of the plate at 91. Dale Thomas, the batter. 
And a first pitch strike. We talked right off the onset here tonight about how well Mizzou pitched last weekend against Vandy. Kept them right in all three games. They gave up 10 runs in those three. They got swept because they only scored two offensively. They have allowed one run on two hits today. But the offense has stranded 14. Thomas is 0 for 3 tonight. Here comes Roosted. And he's starting to get a great feel, it feels like, for that fastball. And he's done it on only 42 pitches. He's a strike away from getting through four innings. And it's been about uh, as smooth as it could be outside of that solo homer for Heyman. And he will sit down the side and order. 16 men left on base for Mizzou today. It's 9-1-2. It's Brock Daniels first. I had said 14. I forgot about the two in the eighth. Luke McNeely has been fantastic, though. The third pitcher used by Kevin O'Sullivan's squad today. And this should be an out to start the inning. Shellnut coming over towards the line. And they get Brock Daniels. You know, we've talked at times about how this sort of looks like a pitcher's duel, but in reality hasn't been the cleanest game. Florida with a couple of errors and a lot of free bases they've given up. Missouri failing to cash in. Since the starters left the game, and I don't want to sell Lunsford short because he pitched really well, but since then, and especially McNeely for Florida and Roostad for Mizzou, it really does feel like a pitcher's duel now rather than sloppiness. Eric Curtis check swing and did not go. Tripled and scored in the first, singled in the fourth. Didn't look like he went to me in real time. The Florida dugout thought so. Oh, well, it's close, but I would say no. Tight, but I would agree. That jammed a bit here. 15th play for Yost. His man number three out in center field today. And now McNeely has sat down six straight. I'm not convinced we're seeing great at bats from either team. You know, that felt like for, for Curtis, I would just want to see him trying to get on top of the ball a little bit more than that, especially because of the speed that he has. You know, obviously that's not the way we approach hitting generally in 2024, but I'd like to see both of these teams putting the ball in play with a little bit more consistency, especially because the pitchers are not making it easy. You have to be willing to, uh, I, I think, put the ball on the ground and, and make the defenses make plays because neither one in particular, Florida, has looked really solid in this game. And from Missouri's standpoint, if they're just playing for everybody take their hacks and let's wait for somebody to hit a solo homer, that feels obviously like it plays into Florida's strengths much more so than Mizzou's. Absolutely. That said, Jackson Beeman is the only Mizzou Tiger that's got two home runs in SEC play so far. And Luke McNeely just not messing around. Now both these guys have been efficient. Roostad 43 pitches for his four innings of relief, and here's 38 for McNeely trying to get through his third inning out of the pen. Trying for back-to-back, -back, three up, three down innings. Chopper up the first lap, baseline, tough play for Caglio. Fields it, flips it, and they get the out. There's the athleticism of Jack Caglio. The bullpen, so it serves them really well that he's only used 43 pitches to get through four innings. He's been incredibly efficient because he's been Lighten up the strike zone. I mean, him and Luke McNeely are, are making it look relatively routine as they carve through their respective opposition today. Did a good job from Janier Hernandez behind the plate today, too. Very solid defensive catcher. Third of the Big East and throwing out base runners last year at Seton Hall. Tanner Garrison is the batter. I've caught lean in a little bit, one and two. The 11th inning. This is the eight hole hitter. He's only batting for a fourth time. Time that one up well, though. Harrison was hit by a pitch his last time up in the eighth. Tim, then Jonas, then back to the top of the order. It Colby Shelton. You mentioned only the fourth plate appearance for Garrison. Missouri's had two guys come up six times. And yet we play on tied at one. Roostad again. When you think about if you're Lunsford and Roostad going through Shelton, who's hitless, 0 for 4. Evans, 0 for 4, 4 Ks. The 3 0 hitter, Caglione, just 1 for 4 with a single. Shelnut, no hits. Kerwin, no hits. That's the top five guys in a vaunted lineup with no base hits. 
as that's rolled over on the ground. Could be a tough play for Culbertson. Sets his feet. He's got a terrific arm, though. Garrison, not the fleetest of foot. Leadoff man is retired. A little unorthodox from Daniels at first base. He let that get pretty deep on him. Normally on those scoop plays, you'll hear coaches teach for guys to get the glove out in front where you can still see the baseball, not lose track of it when it gets essentially underneath your body and, and below the chin where you're not going to be able to see it. But he handled that pretty well. And maybe he was better off in, in letting that take the, the slightly longer hop. And a strike to Hayden Young. So first time through the order tonight for Florida. They went 0 for 8 with three strikeouts. This is the nine-hole hitter and about to finish the fourth time through. Fourth time through the order right now. It's 0 for 8 with three strikeouts. And, well, that's going to be a base runner as Yost is aboard. Well done, Hayden Yost, the freshman. On base any way you can, I mean. Knowing that, that it's about the big boppers in this lineup and, and accepting that he's not one of them in the nine-hole, but that he's got a lot of really big hitters coming up behind him. It's anyway on base, as you said, Max, and got the elbow guard on anyway. Might as well use it. It's another chance to get to. We talked about it early tonight. Shelton, Evans, Caglio, and Shelma. Top four guys all entered this series with OPSs over 1,000. And Shelton. Is that a tough night? Just missed that one. Got a piece. To me, Max, this has to be it for Florida, this inning. You got a guy on you got the top of your lineup, and if you don't score, Missouri has three, four, and five coming up, getting a second look at McNeely. Calls it back again. He's been aggressive down at the count. Now 0 with 2. A couple of strikeouts. He's flown out and lined out. Both fly balls out to right field. Not much wind to speak of right now, if anything, coming in just a bit from right field. Bruce Dads 0-2. Shelton stays alive. I mean, when you're Florida and you only have two hits tonight, the top half of the order's really been struggling, but you can put it all aside if you can come through and get a clutch base hit here and take the lead for the first time in the 11th. And Shelton goes down swinging. It's a massive strikeout for Roostad on a night full of uh, big strikeouts. It's his fifth in four and two-thirds and the 13th strikeout for Missouri pitching tonight. And it, uh, it puts some pressure on Florida now with two outs. And right now, if you're thinking you're Carter Roostad, this is your guy. You got a right-on-right -right matchup. You got Ty Evans, who's been sensational this year, but he's 0 for 4 with 4 Ks. And you have the lefty... One of the best hitters in the country at Jack Canglio next in pitch clock violation, it looks like. This is interesting now, Max. In a, in a normal circumstance, I think I'd be tempted to, to put Yost on the move if we were just in the middle innings because worst case scenario, you have two, three, four next inning. Worst case scenario here, you don't get to bat again. Florida does not like to run either, but off in motion on the pitch. Hernandez is throw down on a hop. Not in time. Yo steals second, and now a base hit could give Florida their first lead. I still like the call. Be aggressive. It's been tough for Florida to string any hits together. In fact, they have not strung any hits together. They have two hits in this game, innings apart. you got to set yourself up to make one more hit count, and they have now. Ty Evans and Tarney on a fastball. 13th. In the SEC at stolen bases. That was just their 17th of the season for the Gators. Massive spot. Florida just 0 for 2 with Medit scoring position all night long. 1 2 coming. Good pitch. Count evens up. What a night this would be for Ty Evans, huh? Strike out four times, but still have a chance to be the hero. How many times have you seen a guy with the golden sombrero be the hero at a gig? He's got a chance here. Evans pulls one foul. He's 0 for his last 11. He's 0 for 4 today with 4 Ks. But this is the part of the order that's been the absolute best. The meat for this Florida offense. 62 home runs, top 10 of the country. 
Johnny Evans has seven of them. He's driven at 24 this year. Another 2-2. Two -two. And a bloop job down the left field line that's out of play. If nothing else, and certainly we're not at the time of the game where these kind of victories mean as much. This will be the 19th pitch of the inning for Rustad after he was had thrown fewer than 11 per inning to get to this point. And he can't have a whole lot left. Evitz cranks one up to shallow left center, but got under it. That'll hang out. Easy play for Jarrett Curtis. Florida strands the go-ahead mad. It's chance to walk it off. McNeely has not allowed a base hit in three innings. One walk, four strikeouts. He has retired seven in a row, going back to the strikeout to end the eighth. He came with two men on base. But behind now, rare time he's been behind here. Trevor Austin in front of the count. 2-0, oh, he singled and walked. In my mind, Trevor Austin is the exact guy Mizzou wants leading off with a chance to walk off in extra innings. Hitters count. And he was trying to end the game with one swing. And it's funny, the reason I was going to give is that he's not going to do that. That he's a high OBP guy who's always thinking, how do I get on base? He's a veteran who's not going to be bothered by the situation, and he'll do whatever is the best play for the team. I don't think that swing was the best play for the team. Nor was that one. Two at two. Austin's been on base four times. He also has been hit and did reach via the E6 second error of the night for Shelton. Big 2-2 two -two on the way. It's side corner. Strike three called. Went right back to it. Did Luke McNeely. Punch out number five for the freshman. Trevor Austin's frustrated with the call. We'll get a second look at it perhaps and, and be able to judge for ourselves. But regardless, uh, maybe it's a touch off the inside, but, but first of all, a little close to take. And second of all, he's probably regretting having borderline wasted the first two strikes, or at least wasted the second strike after he came up empty on his first big swing. That was just too much, and it's not what you need leading off an inning. And Jackson Lopez just took another big hack. I don't know where Missouri's heads are at right now, but this has been a terrible approach. The swings have been getting away from them as the sophomore steps out, tries to recalibrate. A one hit sharply, it's by the dive of Thomas. Seventh base hit of the night for Mizzou. Lovich is thinking two. The tag is not in time. A one out double. Lovich is fired up with good reason. Wouldn't you know it, Max? The first normal swing out of four. Missouri's best hitters, Austin and Lovich, they need to trust themselves. That's what Lovich does. Safe call at second base. Previous play is under review. Florida's going to use it, its second challenge here. It looked to my eye like Lovich beat the play. Ooh, just a little hesitation from Shelnut trying to get out of his glove. Lovich forcing the issue. He looked like he was in there. Missed the last seven games. That looked pretty clean cut. I think that's a double. Credit as well. The second base umpire Alex Ziegler who was right on top of it. The downside as well of this challenge is that I think Florida's six chances of success are low and it forces McNeely to stand around and throw some warm-ups. After review, the safe call at second is confirmed. Florida is out of challenges for the game. No more challenges for Florida, and there is the winning run at second. One more look at it. And while Mizzou does not slug the ball well, they pride themselves on how they run the bases and their aggressiveness. And they made Tyler Shelnut deliver his strike. It took him an extra second to get rid of the ball. Throw was a tiny bit offline. This is a good play by Kate Curlin, who's got to get it on a hop, reach back across his body and make a tag. He made it close. But the length of Lovitz just barely gets in there. Mizzou's got a chance for their first walk-off victory of the season. Florida, they've won the last six series, all six weekend series they have played. 
They have won 20 of the last 21 meetings against the Missouri Tigers. Mizzou could change that with a base hit right here. Luke McNeely, the freshman on the mound, facing another freshman in Caden Peer. And he hit him. Oh, that was loud. You could hear that from up in the booth. Boo Birds raining down, and there's two on base for J.D.R. Hernandez. And that's tough, Nate. That's kind of like what you talked about with the lengthy delay. McNeely's trying to throw and just keep himself warm, but first pitch after the challenge delay and then a mound meeting, and it just completely got away from him. You know, Max, what I was going to say was less about hitting a guy with a pitch and more about how much a wild pitch could hurt Florida in this situation. You don't want to allow Lovich to move to third with fewer than two outs. It might be fortunate for the Gators that that one hit Pierre as opposed to going to the backstop. Now a chance for J.D. Hernandez, who entered today the best Mizzou Tiger when it comes to batting average in SEC action at 250. Staying right on that mark with a what for four night. Hernandez does not run well, but it would be a little bit tough to double him off just because Caglione is playing well off the line and behind Pierre at first. But Pierre's got a massive lead. Pop up right side. Caglione to the wall and more life for Janier Hernandez. And they, just like you said, pop up right side, foul ground. It's probably finding the seats here at Taylor Stadium. Caglione initially is thinking maybe he has a chance at that, and it ends up, what, eight rows, ten rows deep? See the one for 16 we've talked about with runners in scoring position. You're not going to win many games doing that, but on the other side, Florida's 0 for 3 with better scoring position. Hernandez chops one left side. It's through for a base hit. Lovich around third. It's bobbled by Shelna. A walk-off win for the Tigers. Thank you.